I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. It's the beginning of Westerns Month, our theme month for our recordings in the month of... Whenever it comes yeah, out. Yeah, whenever it comes out. And so we decided we were going to do, as we usually do, four movies. And we're going to do them based on different categories. Uh, we're going to have a John Wayne, a classic era non-John Wayne, a spaghetti western, and what I refer to as a contemporary western. Now, I'm stretching this some because our movie from today is from 1992. It's nearly 30 years old. Well, let's put this into perspective. Like, it's, it's known with aging like you think of the past as being more recent than it was. So to us, this was a contemporary Western. Indeed. But it's no longer contemporary. Yeah, well, I decided that for our purposes, I'm going to define contemporary Western as any Western made after the death of John Wayne in 1979. Yes, so this, this qualifies under that death of definition. I would even say you could call it a contemporary Western if it was made after 1990, mm. which this also qualifies. Yeah, true. So, But this is 1992's Academy Award winner for Best Picture and Best Director Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. It's probably the fourth or fifth time I've seen this. It's a great movie. This is a first for you. First time all the way through, I've seen a couple of scenes from it, mm. but first time all the way through. Mm. Yeah. And you had a good time. This was great. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. This was as good as pretty much any, you know, this was a very enjoyable Western. It's as good as, as many a Western as I've seen. It's about as fine a Western as has been made in our lifetime, I yeah. think. It's uh, close to perfect. I haven't seen a ton of John Wayne Westerns. I've seen several, but not a ton of them. You mean Clint Eastwood? Sorry. Yes, Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. Westerns. Thank you for the correction. I haven't seen a ton of Clint Eastwood Westerns. I've seen, you know, a handful. But this was this was very good. This yeah. I can see why he was popular in those in that genre. Yeah, and I think it's uh, kind of a capper. I believe this is the last western that uh, Clint Eastwood starred in. It's kind of like The Irishman being the okay. summation of Martin Scorsese's mob mob movie career. This uh, film was written by David Peoples, a screenwriter best known for Blade Runner and Twelve Monkeys. So it's more science fiction than westerns, but again, this classic western. He's still uh, with us. Uh, we'll get into the cast in a moment, but I did want to briefly comment on just how beautiful the score is in this movie. It's, uh, I first thought that this was a Clint Eastwood score, because it's a Clint Eastwood movie, but it's not. It was written by a man named Lenny Nahas, and Lenny Nahas is a big influence on the sound of Clint Eastwood's own scores, which he started doing, I think, in earnest after Flags of Our Fathers in 2005. I think he's done basically all his own scores since then. But this sounds very similar. Mr. Nahas basically was the preferred composer for Mr. Eastwood for around 20 years. Uh, he passed away last year, but he also wrote the scores for such Clint Eastwood fare as Pale Rider, Heartbreak Ridge, Bird, A Perfect World, The Bridges of Madison County, Absolute Power, Space Cowboys, and Bloodwork. Hmm. This film has an excellent cast, helmed, of course, by Mr. Eastwood as Will Money. Bill Money. Bill, yeah, Will or Bill Money. Yeah. Uh, Gene Hackman as Sheriff Little Bill Daggett. Morgan Freeman as Ned Logan. Richard Harris as English Bob. James Wolverett as the Schofield Kid, who I refer to as not Christian Slater. <laughs> Saul, Saul Rubnick and Francis Fisher uh, uh, Saul Rubnick is W.W. Beauchamp and Francis Fisher is Strawberry Alice, a madam in a whorehouse in Big Whiskey, Wyoming she and Mr. Eastwood would be a couple they would have a daughter together the actress Francesca Eastwood interestingly, Francis Eastwood and her daughter played the same character in season 3 of Fargo one playing the character circa 2010 and one playing the same character in a flashback in the 1970s. Nice. They look remarkably alike. Yeah. So the basic story is... We also have Anna Thompson as Delilah Fitzgerald. Yes. And she she makes a strong impression. I actually thought her character arc was going to go different at the end, but I'm sure we'll get to that later mm. on. So the basic plot is Bill Money. It used to be notorious alcoholic and criminal and he's killed women and children he's involved in various robberies and he's killed a u.s marshal but he met a woman and this film begins and ends with text crawl about her 
she is in a in a way the most important character in the movie, even though she's nowhere in the movie as a physical presence. This woman tamed him, and fortunately passed away. Uh, this film is set in 1881, and she dies in 1878, leaving him with uh, two young children and a struggling farm. And they have a situation where there's some kind of a bug getting to the pigs, and they're very pig dependent, and. A young man rides up to the farm one day on the Kansas Plain named the Schofield Kid, who in, uh, is looking for Bill Money. Self-proclaimed as the Schofield Self-proclaimed. Kid. And he's looking for Bill Money because his uncle had once rode with him back in, back in the day and said, if you ever need a partner for some killing, you should get my friend Bill Money. So he, he tracks him down. Bill's like, I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. But the pig situation is getting bad, and he starts to think, I could really use that money because he's told that they're tr- going to kill two cowboys that cut up a woman. Mm-hmm. And they get a rather exaggerated version of what happened. Well, I can't remember if Schofield, and you can correct me on this, I can't remember if Schofield tells the exaggerated version up first or if he just tells them that he's been cut up. No, he. And then Bill Money exaggerates yeah. it. Yeah. So he tells an exaggerated version, but it is further exaggerated by Bill Money yeah. uh, when he tells Ned Logan, uh, the Morgan Freeman character. So money eventually decides I gotta I'm gonna do this. We need the money, and so he goes. It's a thousand dollar reward. Thousand right? dollar, yep. yep. Which is a heck of a lot in 1881. Yeah, and so he tracks down his friend Ned, who lives not far away. Eventually convinces him to join join him, and they track down the Schofield kid, who they realize is a decent shot, but has horrible eyesight, and so he can only really get you up close. Yeah. And they decide to head to Dry Whiskey to get that revenge. The kind of B storyline has to do with events in Dry Whiskey. Well, the sheriff has been made aware, and Dry Whiskey has been made aware of this reward before any of these characters start to arrive. So he started, they've passed new ordinances, they've got new restrictions in the town, things like that. No guns in town, you have to. You have to surrender your weapons when you come into the county. But yeah, Little Bill is is on top of it he thinks he's got a thing in place they have this guy english bob that comes to town to collect the reward or the duke of death the, du- or or the duck me, of death the duck of death and he is carrying around uh, ww bochamp his uh, biographer is writing exaggerated stories about him and he's like bochamp i think just kind of took things at face value exaggerated a little but didn't realize how much the English Bob himself was exaggerating. English Bob isn't particularly good at what he does. He's just got an overblown reputation. He's played by the great Richard Harris. Yes. And he knew little Bill Daggett before. It sounded like Daggett was something of a... I don't know if he was really a criminal before or what he was before he was the but sheriff. he was in the towns back in yeah. you know, the, the wild, wild west. Yeah. And when some of these people were creating their reputations mm-hmm. and... English Bob got his reputation for working for the railroad, killing, as they refer to it in the movie, Chinamen, mm-hmm. you know, Chinese laborers on the railroads when things were going awry, which did happen. But yeah, so that's how he gets his reputation. And they have a, a wonderful little conflict there where little Bill just kicks the snot out of him. Just yeah, wipes a little the over the with top, him. but yeah. And he does such a good job that he wins over the biographer that decides to stay with him and write his story that well, I, maybe so I can make a lot this of that guy happens into. in that jail scene too when oh yeah when he starts reading the book that Beauchamp is re- is writing and then starts to correct Beauchamp on it and so Beauchamp becomes infatuated with little bill and then there's a little incident uh, little bill's trying to illustrate to Beauchamp how hard it is to shoot someone and gives English Bob the opportunity to shoot him English Bob thinks he's getting played and so he doesn't take the opportunity and it turns out he was being given a legitimate chance to kill yeah. Little Bill, and then you he, know, empty, he empties the bullets at the end, and 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 at his look like, oh, I could have yeah. could have got you, and he's like, you made the right choice. I would have killed you. Yeah. So Little Bill is sent, or English Bob is sent away, which I, you know, as, as present as he is in the early part of this movie, it was interesting that that's all he's there for. Hmm. It's just to establish this relationship between Beauchamp. And Little Bill. Which is a great relationship. And it's neat how... It, it's like having a biographer causes people to just start to spin these tales or to get kind of pumped up. Yep. And so he starts to kind of get 
into he's himself. He's getting full of himself. Yeah, yeah, toward towards the end, which doesn't bode well for him. But yeah, so Bill, Ned, and the Schofield kid make their way into dry whiskey, but they've been caught in a rainstorm, and Bill has caught a cold or something. Mm. And so when they get into dry whiskey and come into the bar to, you know, make contact with the ladies of the night and clarify the reward and make sure that they know they're there for it and things of that nature, little Bill confronts Bill and beats Bill up quite, you know, far more than is necessary. Mm -hmm. But thinking, you know, you don't know how much of it's just to prove a point and how much of it is... You know, because that's what he was trying to do with English Bob is prove his point and, mm. and get a reputation out there that this is what's going to happen if you come for the reward in his town. What did you think of his character, of Hackman's character? Oh, it's a great character. Oh, yeah. But at he... first I really liked him. Uh-huh. And then by the end of the movie, I didn't really care for him that mm. much. He's such a presence. And this is a Clint Eastwood movie, but every time he's on the screen, he dominates. Well, even when little Bill kicks the crap out of Bill while he's sick... Like, you still have a certain amount of respect for little Bill as the sheriff. Because he's, he's, he's a dang good sheriff for this community. He, like, he keeps shit from happening. Yeah. But later on when there's that scene with Ned, then you lose all respect for little Bill and, you, and pretty much any empathy for little Bill. So, and we'll, we'll get to that as we progress through the plot. But Bill Money gets the crap kicked out of him. You know, they, Ned and the Schofield kid are able to escape out a back window. And get Ned on... Well, look, Bill is climbing on his own horse, and they're able to just grab his horse and lead him off somewhere where they can recuperate. They've made contact with the ladies of the night working at... Is it Greeley's or yeah. Greenies? I think it's Greeley's. The bar in town. It's the billiards place. The billiards place, even though they burned the billiard table, what was it, four years ago? Yeah, they built. Uh, they burned it for firewood in the winter of 78. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of code for a warehouse. That's yeah. what it is. But Ned and, and the Schofield kid go to scout things out at the Barty Ranch where the two workers who cut up who cut up Delilah work and are staying. And we do see that incident. It's the very beginning of, of the film. Yeah. Where we see what happens, and we see a little bit of the aftermath. So uh, the, big, the big one, the big, the big cowboy, he um, is have, having a, some time with Delilah, who instinctively laughs uh, when he sees that he is not a particularly well endowed, well endowed yeah. uh, member of the male sex, and this makes the man so angry that he cuts up her face. This makes Strawberry Alice and the rest of the uh, the prostitutes very very upset, and they want revenge. But the sheriff is just was going to beat them, and then comes to a deal. He was going to bull whip them. Bull whip them. But that you know, Strawberry Alice didn't think that that was a sufficient punishment. But the bar owner points out that he had a contract with Delilah and that she's his property and that he's the one who's really out something. So little Bill imposes a fine on these two gentlemen and tells them that they have at first thaw they have to bring ponies in yeah. to give to the bar but, owner. Because they work at a ranch. They're going to get five from the guy that actually did the deed and two from the other. His, yeah, his co His associate. And they eventually do show them coming and delivering. You know, the they, horses, they yeah. pay what was due. And in fact, the, the other guy, the guy who didn't do the, the, the beating, he brings them another horse to give to the girl. To Delilah. To Delilah for something he didn't do. Yeah. And they, the way they react is great because they don't know how to react to this. They're just so, especially Strawberry Alice, who really, like, I get her point, but she goes A little beyond. too far. It's very Shakespearean. Because, it, you know, like Shakespeare's place, there's an injustice, and then somebody overreacts to the injustice. And that's kind of what sets things well, into motion. Well, I can understand her reaction to a certain extent, especially yeah. like the reaction to the horse. You know, it was a nice gesture on his part, but how does that compensate for her face having been cut Yeah, but up? how can he possibly compensate? Well, but he never could have. Yeah. And But I can understand her point of this attempt at compensation is somewhat insulting. I, I can understand that to a limited extent. Yeah. You know, I mean, if someone slashed your face and then tried to give you a car as compensation, would you consider that compensation? I have such a beautiful face. You know what I mean. You have to be a very beautiful car. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But it's not compensation for something like that, especially, let's, let's rephrase that. If they did something to you that deprived you of your livelihood, oh, would a car be compensation? 
be better uh, than nothing. Because she's a lady of the night, mm. and with her face slashed, she's not going to be getting a lot of business, no. so to speak. So giving her a horse is not really making amends. And and I understand Strawberry Alice's point in that regard, but like you said, it was better than nothing, which was what she was getting. Strawberry Alice wanted that to happen, and the guys being horse whipped or worse, you know, which was never realistic. Mm, yeah. Um, but this was you know, represented in a bygone era. Like, that's that would have been how... I mean, that's it's believable yeah. from that era. This, this, this film feels, for the most part, very realistic, with one exception, which I'll get to in a little bit. Morgan Freeman? Morgan Freeman. Yeah. So the sheriff... So uh, Bill goes, he recuperates. The kid... Schofield kid. Schofield kid and Ned, they head out and they kill one of the cowboys... The three of them. The, th- the three, yeah. Well, well he rec- so they, they scout, and then... Those yeah. two scout, and then the three of them go out. Yeah. Ned and, shoots the horse out from underneath the guy. And um, this is after Bill has recuperated. Bill yeah. at, thought he was going to die, and he was having these apocalyptic visions of his wife's face with worms and death and hell and people he'd killed. Absolutely convinced he was going to die. Uh, and he recovers, and he goes out to try to finish the job. They get the, the one guy, and that's a great sequence when he's shot and he's dying and his friends are like over some rocks and he's crying out for water and it just gets on Bill. Bill's nerves yeah. and he's like bring him some water we won't shoot you yeah shut him friend, up and his friends like y- you promise not you know you're not going to shoot yeah. us and he's like no take him the water and they don't they they stand there and let him take him the water because the guy's and dead then, and then he dies you know yeah. he's been shot in the gut and yeah that's a great freaking scene yeah and the way that that well, morgan that's freeman when ned realizes that he can't do yeah this. he can't do it and so as soon as that happens ned actually is like i'm going home i I, yeah. I can't be a part of this i'm going home you guys do what you're gonna do bill is you know committed to this at this point he's commit killed one of the guys he needs the money mm. you know and so he's committed to this and Ned leaves the Schofield kid and Bill and goes home, but is, is captured by yeah. some of the Barty workers. But they don't realize this until after the, after the job's after done. After the job is done. They go back to get the other guy who goes to use the outhouse. Well, they're staking out the Barty ranch, you know, one of the cabins at the ranch. And they basically, this other guy's been told to, to hunker down at... You know, in this cabin, and with several of his co-workers, the sheriff for sends one of the deputies there. Yeah, for that well, purpose. Well, plus he's also got his co-workers. Yeah, and they're hunkered down, and Bill and the Schofield kid basically sit downwind from the the outhouse where no one's going to look for him mm. as their cover to sit there and wait for this guy to come out and use the outhouse. And they're there while several other people use the outhouse and just stay concealed. Mm. And of course, finally the guy comes out and goes to the outhouse and. The Schofield kid has been boasting about how many people he's killed, but it's pretty obvious he's full of baloney. Mm-hmm. And there's this repeated exchange between him and Bill about how Bill's going to you know, let the Schofield kid kill him. And so when he goes up to the outhouse, the Schofield kid goes to get him. And first, apparently it's a two-holer outhouse. <laughs> so he opens the wrong half, half of the outhouse, you know, and then that's at the same that's right when the deputy starts to come out and so bill's giving him cover cover fire he has to open the other side of the outhouse and and eventually is able to kill the guy but this is also a moment of conscience for the schofield kid mm-hmm. you know this is was we learned the first time he's actually yeah. killed someone and it's also as i pointed out logistically one of the best places to kill somebody yeah because when one dies one bowel is released and if he's already sitting on the toilet there's far less maintenance necessary in the, in the for those cleanup, who yeah. Come along after. So it's it's the polite way to kill somebody. Yeah. The, Ned was not afforded that same opportunity. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah, you know, Ned. And while this is happening, Ned has been captured by a couple of Barty workers and has been tuned up. So little Bill sends a couple of his deputies to retrieve Ned and bring him back into town, and proceeds to bullwhip him. Yeah. Quite harshly, while W. W. Beauchamp was watching on. And gets, you know, Ned tells some lies trying to, to provide cover for his friends. And he's been whipped enough and beaten enough. He can't keep his lies straight. Little Bill confronts him on it and then calls for a couple of the ladies of the night to be brought over. Because, you know, and he tells Ned, he says, they're going to tell different lies than you do trying to cover for you. And when they do, I'm not going to take it out on the women. 
Yeah. You know, and he says, I'm not going to be gentle like I was before. And we later learn that little Bill, in trying to punish Ned, literally just beats him to death. We don't see this. Yeah. This, this is relayed by one of the prostitutes when she comes to deliver the reward to the uh to the to bill and, to bill and the, the, the kid. schofield kid yeah and he's talking to the schofield kid when they get it you know it's like do we want to count it now or we should deliver our share to ned so that you know that i'm not holding out on you and the prostitute's like uh you're not going to be delivering that to ned because ned's dead yeah he's and he's dead in front of uh Greeley's, propped up in a coffin with a sign that says he's an assassin yeah and of course this really pisses off bill who determines he's going to go and take revenge. He dispatches the Schofield well, kid. Well, even that scene is great because he tells the Schofield kid to give him his pistol. And he says, you know, he hands it over and says, well, I'm never going to shoot anybody again. You just keep it. You know, and he tells him, you keep all of the money. Yeah. I don't, you know. And apparently the Schofield kid's motivation, we learn, is to have gotten spectacles and to have yeah. gotten himself some nicer clothes and things of that mm-hmm. nature. Bill is a man of his word and tells the Schofield kid, he says, basically, just basically tells him, go back to my house, deliver, you know, my portion and Ned's portion to my kids and tell my kids that if I'm not back in two weeks to take Ned's portion to his wife. Yeah. And when the Schofield kid's arc is completed. Yeah. Very. And so efficient. this is the, leads us to, I guess you could say the third act of the film. The, the final showdown. And the finale where Bill goes into the town and all the little Bill and all of his deputies are in the bar, thinking that they've accomplished something, and they're gonna go. You know, they're gonna have one night in the bar, and then the next morning they're supposed to be riding out after the other two assassins, and then walks Bill with with his shotgun. That is an image. I mean, that's one of the. That, that's both absolutely one of the scariest film images because Clint East would bring so much to the table when he showed up with a shotgun like that. It's also if I'm a character in a movie. I would be honored to die by Clint Eastwood's shot. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> it's like, it's an honor, sir. Do me in. But yeah, there's the the confrontation between Bill and Little Bill. And, of course, Little Bill shoots first. He shoots the bar owner for allowing them to have put displayed his friend out in front of the bar. And then he goes to shoot Bill and the shotgun misfires. And Bill thinks now he's got... Little Bill thinks he's got Bill... And Bill does what he does. The instinct. And, and they had had earlier scene where he was rusty and he was practicing shooting. And he with his pistol, it. yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't hit a do coffee it. can. But as soon as he's in this moment, it all comes back to him. And he is super good and efficient. He kills five men with like five shots. Yeah, well, him and little, Bill and Little Bill have their shootout. Little Bill gets the first shot off but misses because Bill outmaneuvers him. And Little Bill shoots him in the gut. And then as the other deputies proceed to start drawing their weapons, you know, Bill dispatches them one, two, three, one four. at a time, yeah. you know. And then it, he tells them, anybody else that doesn't want to die, go out the back. Whoop. And all of the rest of the deputies leave. They eventually find Saul Rubnick is still alive, but he's yeah. under the body of somebody that's been shot. It's the fat deputy who'd been at the Bartu yeah. Ranch. Yeah. And then they have this conversation, uh, the two of them. And then you have that he's not quite dead moment with Gene Hackman, little Bill. Yep. As he decides he's going to try to kill Big Bill, and he kicks the gun out of his hand, or he shoots the gun out of his hand. Well, so little Bill has retrieved the rifle, Ned's rifle, and has loaded, just finished loading it, and is drinking whiskey, and he hears the the click of the hammer on little Bill's hand, fire on his pistol. And he turns around and kicks it out of his hand. And this is... These closing scenes in the bar are kind of intense. I mean, mm-hmm. Bill stand, standing over Little Bill with, with a rifle. You know, point blank range. And they, they have they do. They have a conversation with Bill holding a I rifle I don't on. deserve this. Deserve has nothing to do with it. Yeah. And he just point blank shoots him with the rifle. And as he goes to walk by, one of the other deputies moves. And he shoots him. I couldn't tell if he... It looks like he shot him in the crotch. And he walks out and opens the door and tells the other deputies, if I see anyone pointing a gun at me, I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to kill your wife, I'm going to kill your friends, I'm going to kill everybody you care about. Burn down your house. Yeah, and nobody... Nobody risks it. Nobody risks it, and he gets out, goes out, gets on his horse. He talks to the girls. And there's this scene as that's happening 
where Delilah is looking on. And Delilah and Bill have had an exchange at the barn where he's recovering. And there's, you know, Delilah clearly admires Bill to a, mm-hmm. to some extent. And as she stands on the street and watches Bill as he's preparing to depart, it's, it's clear that she continues to admire him. Mm-hmm. And he's the only person who seems to have shown any interest in her since her face had been mm-hmm. cut, cut up. And I almost had expected that Delilah might follow him. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's not what happened. That would have happened if this movie had been made in the 50s. Yeah. But it's not what happened in this movie. He, uh, so Bill does go back to the farm. We have the, the text at the end that he went back, retrieved his kids, and disappeared. Some reports that he went to San Francisco and succeeded in the dry good business. And then the movie ends with some, some beautiful score. And this is a great film. One thing I have to ask you, did you think Eastwood was going to die in this movie? Not really. Really? Because I think they were totally setting that up. They, I mean, his, his images of death. You know, when he almost dies, when he's sick. Once he recovered, I expected that he would probably make it to the end of the movie. The, the only way I expected him to die at that end point... Was the final confrontation with, with Little Bill. But that he would have still been... You know, it would have been one of those... He he killed the other guy, but the other guy also got him. But he mm. would have made sure his kids were taken care of. You know, that type yeah. of a scenario. But yeah. Yeah. Because this film is... I mean, I remember when I first saw it, I was pretty convinced that he was going to die in this film but he didn't which is wonderfully unexpected the the question that i had and i i couldn't control myself and i asked you this before the movie even ended as as bill mundy rides out of town did i say that correctly yeah money money bill money as bill money rides out of dry dry whiskey i asked nate what happens to this town now well by the the saloon owner's dead Mm -hmm. the sheriff is dead several of the deputies are dead yeah the remaining deputies have been proven essentially to be cowards. Yeah. What happens to this town now? Well, I mean, one possible thing that happens is the women take over the the operations of the billiards club. But there's no... Well, can... Strawberry pro- Alice could run it. Well, can, can they own property at that point? I believe so, by the 1880s. I'm not positive on no. that, but yeah. I'm not going to dispute it with you uh-huh. because I'm not positive, but... You know, but you'd have to import a new sheriff. Yeah. You know, well, you that can't... town, that town is in the long run doomed to be a ghost town. Yeah, it just it, it has that aura about it. Well, but is this the catalyst that turns this into a ghost town? It could well be. Yeah, who knows? But yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, it was very well executed. Let's talk about the. I don't know if you call it the whole of the movie, but the really in the movie, which is Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman obviously is an African American gentleman. Not one line of dialogue in this movie refers to him being black. Not one. I expected there to be a couple when he's captured. It's a subtext in certain scenes, like when he's being whipped, because it can't not be, because we have a knowledge of of what that means, especially in the 19th century. It's an interesting choice. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me if the part was written, you know, not specifically for him. You know, it was written probably in the the writer's mind was going to be a white guy, because why wouldn't it be? Yeah. So it's interesting that they have this opportunity to talk about race in this film, and Clint Eastwood, being a conservative, has absolutely no interest in doing that. Like, he'll let people read into it, the certain subtext, but, like, no racial slurs are used against him. There's the scene when he goes upstairs to, to visit the prostitutes, and everybody's kind of watching him go up there, and it's like, uh, 1881 Wyoming, and if black man goes upstairs to the prostitutes, the people down in the bar are not going to be cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not going to be they're not yeah. gonna they're gonna they're not gonna chill out about it yeah is it an interesting choice i uh, one can make can argue about it There's i didn't parts of i didn't it I think, appreciate and, and parts yeah. of it that you can yeah i didn't over. think it it sank the movie in any way but no it was noticeable oh yeah absolutely yeah especially like you said the la- once he's captured the lack of any epithets or anything yeah. like that you know that that stands out hmm I guess the other subtext of the film is religion. We didn't really talk much about that other than Bill, uh, his wife, Christianized him and got him to give up drinking. And there's this big kind of will he, won't he take a drink over he the course of the film. He resists it until after he's killed the guys. Yeah. You know, that's he's held off on it all the way till that point. And then once he finds out Ned's dead, then then yeah. things go out and as soon as he starts drinking, he's back to 
to Bill Money of old. Yeah. So, this was actually nominated for four Oscars. All right. Do you remember? Do you you mentioned uh, best director, best picture, which it won, and the other two are best actor in a supporting role for Gene Hackman, mm -hmm. which oh. he won. Oh, and he deserved it. And it also won for best film editing. So it actually was nominated. Oh, it was nominated for more than four Oscars. It, it won, won four. four. Mm -hmm. It was also nominated for Best Actor in a Leading Role for Clint Eastwood. Nominated for Best Screenwriting, Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen for David Webb Peoples. Best Cinematography, Best Art Direction, and Best Sound. No score nomination? No. Oh, I think it's a very beautiful score. Yeah. This film was a major box office hit. Was it? It was made for $14.4 million, and it made $159.2 million at the box office. Yeah. So it's a big hit, yeah. especially in 1992 dollars. Yeah. Well, and we've only done, have we done one or two other Clint Eastwood directed movies on the podcast? I can't recall. Because we did Richard Jewell. Yeah. I don't think we did The Mule. No. Nate and I are a fan, especially of these later directed, Clint Eastwood directed movies. But Clint Eastwood is a very capable director. Yeah. And everything I've seen that Clint Eastwood has directed, I've been impressed with. This film has a 96% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Its Metacritic score is 85. With an 8.2 average on IMDb, which is really high for IMDb. Yeah. Yep. How would you rate this film? I will tell you, I'll give this 4 on the 4 star scale. Mm -hmm. On the 10 star scale, I'm giving it 9. Just uh, because it is a little violent. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to give it 4 stars, and I'm going to give it a 10. Yeah. I could give it a 9, because there are certain imperfections in it, but it's just so overwhel overwhelmed by what's good about it. And there's a handful of scenes in this movie that are just absolutely riveting, perfect scenes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this film leaves nothing to be desired in terms of holding your attention. No. You know, you're... Yeah. It was great. Do you feel kind of like, ah, oh, I can't believe I never saw this movie before? Actually, yeah, to a certain extent. I was really fairly unfamiliar with this movie. The couple scenes that I'd seen from it, I didn't know were from this yeah. until I was watching it today. Mm -hmm. I'm actually baffled how I made it this far without yeah, seeing this movie. Yeah, years. Especially considering how many westerns my grandfather watched. Mm -hmm. He was a huge western fan, and I, I've watched other Clint Eastwood movies with him. John Wayne was his, his absolute favorite. But he, you know, he liked Clint Eastwood too, and so I'm not I'm genuinely surprised and unsure how I avoided seeing this film. So, well, that is an omission that has been rectified. Yes, thanks to Nate and his. This was one of Nate's selection for Western. This is like the first one that came to mind when we were going to do Western months. We got to do one for him. Yeah, for Nate it was. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, so we'll fill you in on the other movies as we progress. Well. Should we film them in now so they can do homework? Well, we, we talked a little bit about the type of movies we're, we're going to, you know, a John Wayne yeah. and a Spaghetti. And... I guess only one of the one is fully picked out at this point. So mm -hmm. the other two are still kind of a little bit in limbo. So, well, no, you've picked out the other one. Yeah, yeah. But you don't want me to know what it yeah. is. And the, the John Wayne is, we're still going back and forth on which John Wayne we're going to watch. Because if you're going to just watch one John Wayne, it's hard to pick. Mm. So, anyways... I'm Rob. I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. Boop, boop, boop. I've created plenty of editing homework for myself. Yeah, you have. This is one of the longer episodes I will have had to have edited in quite a while. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We could just edit out the first 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to keep it in some form, but I don't know what to do with it. Or I'm just going to, or I'll take a couple of clips out of it and then get rid of the rest or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah felt like I explained 2020 from a pull operator's perspective, from Sam Rockwell's perspective in the way, way back pretty well. Mm. But, yeah. Yeah, the last weekend, the first weekend that the pool was open, so I opened the pool on May 22nd, which here in Utah was not great weather. Mm. And so opening weekend of the pool for me felt just like that, that scene in the way, way back yeah. when it rains at the water park. And because I've seen that movie... Well, so we watched it for the podcast, and then Melinda and I are, have already watched it again in May. Yeah. And so, like, it felt really fresh and, like, really familiar when I was sitting down there 
on May 22nd and May 23rd doing the maintenance and nobody's around. <laughs> yeah. So. So on and so forth. Yeah, I'm sure this was. Did I really just ramble for nine minutes yeah, about I, the I, fucking I, pool? I had, I'm, I'm sure that was difficult, but you got what's going to be an absolutely riveting nine minute outtake out of it. Well, absolutely I was actually riveting. like, I'll let it this and leave it in, but not if it's freaking nine minutes. <laughs> Not if it's nine minutes. Make it its own video. Rob Jeez. talks about the pool. Twenty twenty minutes for pool restrictions. <laughs> Jeez Louise. I guess our levels are tested. Yeah. I wasn't like paying too close attention to the levels, but you just like hitting this because you can see the waveforms yeah. like I know. But it's when you're actually editing, that's bad. 